Now, this is really simplified, but I kind of find it one of the more sort of ugh, things, is that let's say how people change mood. This is a very simple model, you know, um, sort of an S curve, a sigmoid curve there. Uh, and here you are. Do you believe that economic growth is going to continue? You're all down here. We are. We're all down here. We have that belief. Do governments believe this? By and large, they're down there. Or no, well, there's very few of them. There's very few of us, basically, down here. Belief in no growth. Now, we're going to start, if we're going to start going out into the world, our governments are going to start, and say they say, oh my God, you know, we're not coming back. We're going to have food security risks. This is really emergency. We're in an emergency situation. People panic. So I've used the bond market as just a simple idea of the future. So we're, uh, we needn't be too specific. So uh, energy and food prices, warnings, Obama is warning. Uh, look, an Obama warning is worth 100 times my, my prime minister's warning, you know, because he has more status in the world, has bigger effect, has heard more. So it depends who's saying it. Warnings, stock and bond markets start to go jittery. Then people respond. They start dumping assets and saying, what can I buy that's resilient? I want some land. I want some gold. I want some this. Um, but there's not that many sellers of land. And there's something like, if you exclude uh, derivatives, there's something like 300 billion of stuff of some sort of notional assets floating around. So it starts jumping out. Oh. Uh, starting to get fearful. They see more things dropping, prices dropping. you got to get out. It goes, and suddenly you have and things start to collapse. In other words, action causes the collapse of many of the things you want to do. And this is also true um, like when Nicole is going around telling people what they might do. Um, we do that in Ireland. We do it a bit in Britain. You kind of know. You're kind of going there. You know, If you all do this, we're a bit screwed. <laughs> you, know, you start to take down the banking system, and you kind of go, you know, then what the fuck do we do? You know. Um, so whether it's the local level or a national level, you'll see why governments. Well, there's other reasons, obviously, why people governments won't do anything. And this is why what we're trying to do, and we're always happy for help and support. You see us at the end. Oh, there you go. That was something I didn't put in, but there you go. You can have a look at that. Um, this is what um, we're trying to do. We kind of realize, number one, is that well, we've been going to government and European Commission and saying we have big trouble. We can't go in there and say, here is the trouble, and offer nothing, and not offer a map. Now, the map isn't saying, what you do, the map is sort of saying, here are options. Here is how to get a handle on something as complex as this. You need to give people a tool. That is presuming you've brought them to a stage where they realize there's a problem. And <clears throat> you know, one tool is how you manage uh, what pre-preparations -pre you can do. Now, this has a problem as well, because ideally, I don't think governments are the real people you want. And actually, one of the things we're using for mapping this is from the US military, which is their star tides country in a box. What do you do if you're in a collapsed country? You know, how do you, tr no, yeah, I, I saw your face. You saw that sort of truncated, you, how do you truncate a problem so that it doesn't overwhelm you? We're also looking at aid development workers, you know, big aid projects. What do you do in a sort of crisis situation? But that's only one part. And I don't want to, I, the last thing I want is these th sort of things securitized. In other words, they're given to military. They need to be um, what you might call, they need to have public ownership. But there's a lot to do. I mean, one of the questions that we talked about in terms of shit and waste and water is actually, you know, most people, because psychologically, if all shit starts to bubble up through their floors, through their cities, or whatever, that is about as psychologically traumatic as you're going to get beyond starving. 
that is not, we, we, it is deep within us. You, know? you need to have a suite of things that people can do with no, with no fancy stuff around. You need to give them a package. You need to be able to say, OK, you know, there might even be jobs in it. You know, this, is, this is fertilizer. I mean, this is high quality stuff. But we need to answer those questions in a simple way. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to, as I say, I haven't done the, the conclusions. We're in the other thing. So I'll just mention a few conclusions and hope you, um, you feel you have to conclude, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> I think that we're going into a major systemic collapse. I think that whether it was just deflation or whether it was, def you know, the, and the indebtedness or whether it was the oil on top of that, it would be especially traumatic because we are so delocalized. There is nothing behind it. We can't go back and do the things we did in 1930 in terms of local currencies. We don't have local this, that, or the other. The fact that it's a convergent issue with food in there as well, the fact that we're so complex, the fact that the cost of our system is so high compared to the people you saw in Kyrgyzstan makes us especially vulnerable, not them. If I wanted to know where in the world I would go, um, you know, to be reasonably all right, I'd, I'd, I'd hang out with them. Um, so the problem, I think, is in a sense that you know, in the sustainability narrative, or even the peak oil narrative, we thought, oh, we need currencies, we need local food growing, we need um, this, that. These are all brilliant. But they won't do. You know, we have that much time, and we're facing something that big. And we've got to think in a much more, how should you put it, how would one put it? Large scale, that doesn't mean government necessarily, but in terms of what you're trying to do. And in some ways, it makes it easier. In some ways, more difficult. But I think for most people, I think that, well, the, the things I would say are important, despite all the, apart from all the technical things. The first is that we have a narrative. We get out a narrative that we are all collectively have a responsibility for this. You know, it wasn't the bankers that done it to us, you know, the greedy people. That doesn't mean we don't keep an eye out. We keep a very sharp eye out for who's creaming the system and how they get away with it or not. But that the narrative is a collective one that we all screwed up. And uh, I found, say, in Ireland, and even in the current crisis, comparing it with Greece and other things. I think we're going to have big trouble very soon. But I do think one of the things that eased it into it is us into it, is, and we've had austerity first in Europe and amongst the first in the world, is number one is it was recent. And people feel a bit guilty for their tackiness, for the crap things they built for this, that, and the other, and for their credit card bills and all of this. Do you know what I mean? So to take a little bit on that on board, because it allows you to move on. It allows you to say, OK, let's stop fighting each other. Let's get to work on things. And the other thing that I think is very important in psychological terms is that if you want people to engage, certainly I've found getting people to engage in dark stuff, is one, give them something to do, give them choices, and give them other people to do it with. It's what I think we're doing. I think, I think for me, it helps that I'm doing stuff because it gives one a sense of purpose around it all. And then as uh, plug the book, Brian Davey, uh, who's one of the people in the book that we've just produced, says, you know, in the end, you know, collapse doesn't exist. What exists is today, now, what's around you, who you're talking to, how you feel. That's all that really exists. So not to let the anxiety or the, the disorientation ever take that away. And one of the things I've found 
is that country, and I've been talking to people here and all that and people I know elsewhere, is that I found the Doomy people to be some of the most level-headed, smiley, humorous, whatever, um, which kind of says something. And I'll kind of leave it at that, and you can ask me questions. Sorry about not having the full presentation, but thank you. <laughs>